And we're live on May 16th stroke 17th, depending on where you are in the world. And we'll be reviewing... Right. That's stroke. not a good thing to say, I don't think, saying stroke. You know, don't give anybody any bad ideas. Okay. <laughs> this battleground, an audio story, full cast adventure. All the old crew. Blake, Blake's seven. Except yep. it's more like five. <laughs> and Morgan's just sitting over there, and he listened to it too, so he might actually have something to say about this at some point. I don't know. Maybe. Who? Me? Oh, yeah. So uh, do you have, like, some convenient summary of this for us, Ben? Or? Right. Well, got what it has on the back of the CD. Now... Jeff, do you want me to read this out in my Aurak voice? No, please. <laughs> no, please? Or... No, please don't. Say, okay, save Aurak well. for, for when we need Aurak, not, not okay. to read summaries. That's... Okay. Because the real Aurak would never do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> yeah, I pulled the control out of Aurak. Yeah. Did I ask um, Avon to tell me what happened in this episode? <laughs> or just Ben, either one. I can try to do Avon, but... Um, but, but not with your mouth full. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll try to do Avon in future. Um, Blake and the crew of the Liberator have a new mission, and their target is on Straxis, a planet also known as Battleground 9. Straxis is a training ground for thousands of Federation troops, and the Liberator has journeyed directly into their sights. Has Blake finally picked a battle he cannot possibly win? Yes. That's why he was killed, and so is everyone else. The end. You know, that'd be a really hilarious thing to do, to, like, you know, audio story, like, set between two TV stories where obviously everything kept going and you just kill everybody off anyway. You know, like... Now, this is what really happened. All the rest of that was a lie. <laughs> Which they sort of did with Doctor Who, because there's been several like different spin-off sort of ranges of Doctor Who audio stuff and, and novels, and in some of them they've just completely decided to just create their own timeline that changes stuff from the <laughs> TV show or whatever. So, Which I don't think entirely is a bad thing. I mean, it's like, hey, you want to explore what... A different uh, way things could have happened, then go for it. You know? Like I would do. Like I could think of several things I was talking about the other day about characters that have that were set up great and then ruined later. Um, there's definitely plenty of uh, shows where I thought, "Hey, this was a great setup of a story," and then they went all wonky with the story. Here's what I would have changed, or or even the story was good, but there was like a couple of things. That I would have changed to make it even better, like uh, that time when I talked about uh, how I would have done that all my children murder mystery storyline, that actually was quite well done, but uh, I would have changed one important factor that would have made it better. But anyway, enough about that. Well, before we talk about the plot, we can talk about the uh, the acting. So, how do you think the regulars are compared to how they used to be on the TV series? I thought they were fine. Um, Morgan made the comment that they sounded old, but, you know, I don't think it made a significant difference in terms of them seeming like... Huh. I didn't have a hard time understanding anybody uh, in this, but um, but the... Uh, well, I said for, in, the fir in the first audio that we listened to that the problem with Avon's voice is not just that he sounds older, but there's sort of there's a certain sort of frequency in his younger voice that is gone from his older voice. Like overall, he sounds the same. But there's a, that certain tone that the yeah. younger version had that sort of adds kind of that sarcastic edge to the stuff he says. It's sort of more of a nasally thing, and it's like he doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So you can still tell it's him, but he's missing that one element that uh, that you know that's missing from his voice. Um. Villa and Jenna both sound very similar to me. They don't really sound like they age that much as far as their voices. 
uh, my problem with the voices was not anybody in the main cast. Is I think it was the casting of two actors who sounded too much like two of the main actors as guest characters. Uh, both uh, uh, Mikulov and uh, what's his face? <laughs> so I don't remember. Voss Ferrell. I don't remember his name. Sorry, I, I'm gone. Crazy. Abel Garman. Abel Garman, the sort of like the ex governor. The guy that wasn't the whiny weirdo? Yeah, I think that was Abel Garman. Okay, yeah. He sounded too much like a younger Avon. <laughs> and uh, Alexandra Mikulov sounded too much like the younger Jenna. So they, they when they were talking, and they would switch the scene to have them talking, at first I was confused as to who, you know, which one of them was talking. So, so to me, it's like when you're going to cast people... Uh, when in an audio production, you got to make sure the voices are different enough that immediately when you hear a voice, you know who's talking. So, I think that might be a, a, an American ears thing. Well, could be. Uh, could just be a uh, me ears. Might not have anything to do with Americans, but I mean, I don't think oh, that I'm probably oh, the oh. only one who would say that. But I don't know whether specifically, you know, plus, other people would have trouble with those particular plus, people. Plus, folks, I don't know if we want to reveal how Jeff heard this, but it wasn't necessarily the the, the the greatest way to hear it in in super duper audio, audio yeah. quality, right? So that that probably factors in, but it took. But I mean, and part of it's just me being dumb and and not focusing on things well because it took me a, a bit before I realized that those uh, those two other male characters were two different people, and it wasn't until the guy got a little bit whinier where I was like, oh, that's a different guy, <laughs> whinier than the other one. So yeah, I don't think this the plot was. Again, for me, it was not easy to follow. And, you know, I don't know what percentage of that is me being dumb or how much is, you know, the actual writing of it. But to me, the first audio one was a lot better. This one was was overall pretty boring and not nearly as uh, as intriguing as the first one. What does Morgan think of it? Um, I don't know. Did you ask him? Morgan, what did you think of it? He hasn't responded, so. Okay. Well, the, 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 at least it's, it was, it, at least we didn't get, it was trash. At least we didn't yeah, no, get that. Yeah, and he didn't say that while he was listening to it either, or right afterwards, so if he was paying attention at all, he didn't think it was that and, and as we know, when Morgan thinks something is trash, he will say it. Yeah. And we'll not be shy about saying that. Right. Right. Um, Did you have anything to say about the story? The... Um, I thought it was a little difficult to follow. And that might be just because it was an audio story. It yeah. was difficult for me to understand who was who because I didn't really pay attention to their characterization, so just hearing them say some stuff didn't really clue me in. Because they, none of the characters were really that intriguing, um, except the Mikulov Chica, but he didn't really do anything worthwhile either. Um, Avon sounded cool. Uh, the satellites didn't make any sense. And, yeah, that was uh, probably the most confusing thing in the story to me entirely. Like, I didn't really get that part. And as usual, they just have, like, decisions and kind of strategic moves that don't really make any sense that they just kind of try to intertwine with some plots and characters it doesn't really go together but that's like kind of Blake 7 just kind of does that in general because I don't know it kind of seems like a little bit of an end disconnect where they kind of have this like idea of what they want to happen they don't really have an actual realistic way to make it happen for whatever reason I think in the first uh, of the audio ones like they were able to be a little bit more understated in when they said things. I mean, there was, there were, there, it was sort of like they knew what moments to kind of raise their voices and act more like something was important. Yeah. Whereas in this one, it seemed like they did a little too much. Like they were trying to, like every minute there's some extreme thing to announce is going on. And it made it just, it, to me, if it's something tries to maintain that, that pace or that um, level of like, Pay attention, because this thing is happening for like an hour. Yeah. It's too long. You can't. It's hard to keep the audience interested that long. I mean, Avon, you know, said things the same way every time. Like he could have been saying, 
we've learned that there's an army of grapes taking over the universe. I mean, he could have said an exact same voice and it would have, <laughs> it would have been like, oh no, we have to prepare for the army of grapes, you know, it's like. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, I sort of, I forgive him for that. It's almost like a tribute to himself rather than the actual thing. But yeah, I'm not saying it's a bad <laughs> yeah. performance by him. It's just, I, I think, I think that's where the director comes in to say, all right, we need to pull this back a little. And, and and on some of these things, not make these dramatic pronouncements about every little thing, because if you do that with everything, then the actual climax of the episode doesn't ramp it up enough, if you know what I mean. Well, I remember the la next one being good and written by Mark Platt, who well, uh, you've, you've, you've not seen his uh, 20th century Doctor Who yet. You haven't seen his like Ace and McCoy story yet ghost light but you have heard um no i have spare parts I've had for about nine years now and i've still never watched it but mm -hmm. that's because the when i first got my first like shipment of doctor who dvds i mean the first one i got was the beginning one i started getting like i sort of was getting them in story order at first but then like i joined i was the part of the columbia house dvd club and they had to like you know get 12 dvds for a penny kind of thing or whatever the deal was and so I got like I got a, the Doctor Who ones that were available from them at the time, the classic ones, and they were scattered across several Doctors. So one of that initial shipment I got was Ghostlight. So and so I've had that one since then, which is like I said, like nine years ago, and I still haven't watched it. But that's because I haven't finished watching the six Doctor episodes. So I'm I will eventually I'll get to it, but who knows when? Ghostlight might not be. Concretoid sense friendly. Oh, well, we'll see. I don't know if that's the term you use for the. I don't know if you call them concretoids. <laughs> I know you call them abstractoids. Yeah, I think it was abstractoids and uh, concretions, I think, were the two. Uh, but I didn't come up with the concretions thing. I came up with the abstractoids. But anyway, uh, yeah, there's some Doctor Who's that are a little too much in that direction, but for the most part, um, not as much. And I remember some of the Seventh Doctor episodes. and even the greatest show in the galaxy, which was the last the, the last one I saw uh, a long time ago, but I don't remember that. I, I still could follow the story. It wasn't like so out there that I was like, I don't know what's going on. We're in some bizarre dream world or something. I mean, it was it had enough stuff to, to you know keep me following the story. And I think so. Anyway, um, yeah. So that's my thoughts on this one. Like, um, just, you know, I listened to the first half of it the other day when I was really tired, and then I listened to it last night when I was also tired, but not quite as tired, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, so maybe, uh, you know, <laughs> with enough uh, energy, I could somehow get into it. But it may just be that it's really just not that great. Um, so if, if they had both been like that, I would think maybe it just the format, I'm just not getting it very well. But the first one was a lot better, so that makes me think that uh, this was just, you know, not just not as good as yeah. that one. Also, it, in the writer's notes, he wrote, this was his first Blake Seven script. Yeah. Yeah, so and it, I think Justin it, Richards did the first one. And it did seem like uh, there was a little too much focus on the people that weren't the main crew and, and that yes, that's the problem with guest it, writers. Yeah. That it, that it's, it sort of could have been any generic characters saying a lot of the lines of the, the, the that Blake's crew was saying there wasn't a whole lot that was really unique to their characters. So, whereas the first one, you really had a lot of that because it was focused on entirely on the ship and the crew. So you got a much more of the interactions between the characters. And to me, it seemed like they were very true to how they are on the TV show. So, Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean, right. but you know, if you're going to have one that's more of a dud, you know, it's better to have it as the second episode than the first one because oh yeah, you're like, well, you know, they've shown it; they can do a good episode, so maybe the next one will be. So. Right. So I'm just going to have a look at these writers' notes. So uh... writers' notes. Bloody hell! I got stuck working on a Blake Seven. I hate this garbage. <laughs> Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> right, yeah, I'll, I'll just read this out uh, a bit. Uh... There's one thing I need to put in this story. It's a whiny commander. Yeah, I, I, I didn't like the performance of Voss Ferrell. 
I did think it was uh, it was funny though that I had uh, that we that there was a true to life moment in this thing written several years ago uh, because just the other day and I won't go into the politics of it but uh, the American president's uh, administration issued a quote guidance unquote on, on a particular issue uh, where they use the term guidance like you know here's a guide for what you will do is that what they and, actually did they say that in this one and it said something like well, advisory the, guidance the, yeah the the, the uh, Mikulov says she, she kept issuing guidances to him where she's like I can't order you to do things I can only give you guidance yeah so it just it was just made me that part made me laugh because I'm like hmm, where have I heard that before <laughs> You get that in the EU, where you got directives, and then uh, yeah, right recommendations. Right, it it uh, when, like you know, things are blowing up, and they're in, and and he's like, "Give me guidance." <laughs> <laughs> right. So we've got here um, the concept of a planet that serves as a training ground for the Federation was not my idea. It came from script editor Justin Richards and formed part of my brief for this script. What a rich concept it is. There are so many story possibilities within that setting, and I considered seven, several options before going for the plots you'll discover here. I drew to a small extent on my experience of training exercises, although happily those I've been involved in feature far fewer explosions and happily no deaths whatsoever. This was my first Blake 7 script. It gave me such a buzz to pen, teleport now, and stand it by 7 for the first time and especially to have Zen in tone information. They're among the many signature lines from this series that I watched so avidly as a young adult. And here I was putting together a story punctuated with them and getting to play with the characters of Rog Blake and his crew. A few weeks after finishing the script, it was a further pleasure to sit in the recording studio and watch the original cast and our wonderful guest actors bring this story to life. They're, they're just the other side of the glass. Sat Paul Darrow and Gareth Thomas as Avon and Blake discovering the surface of the planet Strexis. I allowed myself a big indulgent smile. I'm grateful to have been asked to contribute to Big Finish's first full cast audio series of Blake 7 and to be part of such an exciting story arc. When I turned up at the recording studio, Gareth Thomas asked me straight away what happens next. Hope you'll be Asking that he can't even write an interesting <laughs> little bit. <laughs> Tune out in the middle of that. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, my first thought was he's the anti Morgan because he was like, fortunately, there weren't uh, explosions and death. And I'm thinking Morgan's like, fortunately. I think this one's a little bit better. This by uh, the producer's notes. Um, Roger Blake doesn't get an easy time of it during this series of new full cast audio stories. Not only has he learned of a new crisis that diverts him from his mission to locate Federation's control and so on, but the answer to that new problem appears lie on a team with Federation truth. And over the course of these stories, the culprit of this dire stream of events isn't Travis or Servalan. But our own Supreme Commander, or rather script editor Justin Richards, he is the one who's devised the framework for these six stories and sets the writers on their separate paths. And I think he did a smashing job, one that we're only just getting to fully appreciate in all of its glory as the edited episodes come in. I think the arc of these stories is beautifully shaped. A few words, too, for our guest cast on this episode. Dan. <laughs> Pardon? Isn't the arc of these stories is beautifully shaped? So I said, is it arc shaped? <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> uh, oh, apparently he, he was that. But it was a maybe a new bad actor in Doctor Who. A few words too for our guest cast on this episode: Dan Starkey, yes, Strax from Doctor Who, and Dan Sharkey was Voss Ferrell. See what happens. Oh, I, I think he's better as Strax, though. That's the the Santarn guy I was talking about in yeah. the day. Like he's pretty good at playing that part. Cause it, I mean, they use him as comic relief mostly, but it, it works. Like, mm. you know, I, I think that was, you know, the the Santarns. You know, in the Time Warrior, the guy, you know, that was the that was the ultimate Santarn, and they never, you know, they never matched that again. But 
uh, it, it was kind of funny that in the first two appearances of the Santarans, there was only one. <laughs> but eventually they had a few more, I think. Um, uh, but so anyway, when the new Doctor Who used them, they were like, hey, we can have like a whole actual army of them. You know, as opposed to one dude in makeup with his, you know, looking like a potato or whatever. Yeah. But or yeah. Sometimes um, they also look like a character called, uh, someone called Phil Mitchell. Uh, once. Right. right. Uh... Oh, yes, we found that. Now, in terms of the arc, we found out a new piece of information that uh, this rival to Aurak is called Federak. Wow, how unique. Yes. It's, so it's Aurak, but with a Russian accent, right? <laughs> Maybe. Or Orac in a fedora, or maybe not. Just a Federation version of Orac. Yes. <laughs> Which is naturally speaks in a Russian accent, like all Federations do. I don't think there's much else to say about this. It's too bad Kevin Stoney's not still around, because I would, I would have, I would get him to do the voice of the Federation Orac. Ah. Or, or or just about anything else. That that voice could you know could make me pay attention even if the rest of the stuff is dumb. So. Right. Do you want to know whether it turns up again in Blake Seven? No thanks. Okay. Right. Um, I guess by you asking me that, he probably does though. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm you know is a good thing. So hopefully he's used in a good way. Right. So uh, I don't think I've got. Uh, except that the uh, I remember at the time thinking that the the satellites uh, they closed down a lot of stuff down on the Liberator, so that's why they couldn't just blow them out the sky. And then there was stuff about if they had have blown the, the satellites out of the sky, then it would have caused into themselves. So there were reasons what, why. What 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 were the, what was the satellites' purpose? What were they there for? I think maybe it was just the defense screen. Okay. See, because in my in the image in my head, I just get like a, a a whole bunch of satellite dishes. Was that what they were? Or, I mean, uh, no, no, no. Things. Actual satellites. Floating yeah. Around. There's a whole basically wall of them, so anything could be attacked by actual satellites. Have you seen like, you know, in space, in atmosphere, in orbit around the Earth? You know what I'm talking about? Have you never seen the satellite? Well, yeah, one of those dishy things. No, a, a satellite the, dish is pointed satellite. towards a satellite. So like first satellite ever to go into space? It wasn't a dish? No, it's like this big ball that they oh. threw into space with some antennas on it. Now, whenever I see like an image where they show like, oh, it's like this satellite thing, it looks, it, and it's like, yeah, I haven't, you know, that idea of well, that, that they're all like that, but I guess not. <laughs> no, they're not. If you could look at something like Sputnik. Like a bunch of like little weird looking pieces of metal or something. Some of them, I don't know, they all look different. Depends on what the purpose is. Some of them have cameras on them. Yeah. Some of them have antennas. But in this story, Some like... Did, weird little thin things in this on. in this story, what were they, though? In this story, they were a thin screen used to apparently use like kind of EMP. You said defense yeah. screen? Yeah. Like, there's a whole bunch of them. Apparently. Like they all like locked together into one little big screen? No, they were just in the way and then they would shoot things at the okay. ships. So they were it's just like a, a minefield of, of them, I suppose. A bunch of little ones like just grouped close together enough to form like sort of a screening of... There's just a whole lot. Okay. They weren't even just... There's just a whole bunch. Okay. Yeah, just, it's hard to it's just hard for me to imagine what that is. So that's why I was... Well, imagine like a ship and mines at sea. Sea mines. Yeah. Like that, except not like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just going to see him as satellite dishes then, because, you know. You look up what an actual satellite is. <laughs> well, I have, and there's some that do look like that, because I've seen them before. Like in space. Like right yeah. Here. Have dishes on. It makes sense. Yeah. Because the, the ones tech... transmetting to the right, things that are picking it up. Right, yeah. Because the early Like the, the you know, the. Radio waves yeah, on the, the ones they the use for, like, dishes. the TV satellite right. things, like DirecTV and stuff like that. Right. They have, like, 
their own things up there with direct TV well, written yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have their own. Some satellites have their own dishes on in yeah. space. Yes. Right. They just have like cameras and they're just like basically like a rectangular block of a camera and it's just got these little fins that like help it absorb sunlight or direct its flight path. I don't know shit. Okay, do I'm not an aerospace engineer. Yeah. Yet. Ooh. We can <laughs> leave on that revelation. <laughs> revelation. Right then. So, uh, so hopefully good enough to listen to the next one, uh, drones. So, uh, goodbye from me. Bye.